a young woman by the name of Ellen Harmon in December 1844, barely two months after the great disappointment of the Advent people, received a prophetic revelation from God. Now, in this vision, the Lord showed to her the travels of the Advent people to the New Jerusalem. The vision revealed to the youthful Ellen a bright light, which was identified by the angel as the midnight cry. In this vision, she saw Christ leading the people to the city of God. In listening in on their conversation, she heard many of the believers found that the journey would be longer than they expected. Some of them lost sight of Jesus and fell off the pathway, but those who kept their eyes on Jesus and the city reached their destination safely. So friend, with that little introduction, here's my presentation, which is based on the perspective of Ellen Gould White, found in the book, Early Writings. My name is Brent Winfield, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and this is the Advent Message. Suppose indeed we want to go through the Orion Nebula and go to the throne of God. Here we go. Okay, as we are leaving the Earth here, and of course we'll pass the Earth we see the sun there to our right, now approaching the sun, and you can see the Orion Nebula there past the sun. As we pass the sun, we're probably going over a hundred times the speed of light. And approaching Orion, the individual stars will be passing at different times because they're at different distances from the Earth. But it's actually in the sword of Orion, the middle star of the sword of Orion is the Orion Nebula. We're approaching it here, coming closer, coming closer. The Orion Nebula is 1,500 light years from the Earth. That cavern is actually 100 light years wide. You go into the center of that cavern. We're circling around the trapezium cluster here. This is actually something you can see with the home telescope if you're interested in looking at it. You won't see the nebulosity, but you will see the trapezium. Going through the trapezium, continuing past the trapezium as we come to heaven, to the city of New Jerusalem with the foundations of uh, precious stones, the gates of pearl. Approaching now to the temple in the New Jerusalem. The sanctuary. And as we go to the sanctuary, what are we going to end up with? There is indeed right before us, Christ the great high priest. And, and the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> it's right before the throne of God. Jesus Christ himself, the author of them all, ministering before the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. David, and after we are there, what's going to happen in return? Of course, Jesus, at the time of the second coming, will step out of the most holy place. He will begin to come back to the earth. Of course, Jesus leaving the New Jerusalem there, coming through the open space in Orion. There's the trapezium now. As you exit Orion, that great bowl configuration surrounding Jesus on his return will, of course, be millions and millions of angels surrounding him. Of course, as Jesus himself speeds toward the earth at thousands of times the speed of light. He will have to slow down as he approaches the earth. Coming through the solar system, he passes the sun. Of course, doing many times the speed of light until he gets close to the earth slows down, the people on the earth will first see a dark cloud. And as that dark cloud gets a little closer, a little brighter, a little brighter, and it finally lights up the sky. And as it lights up the sky, those people who are alive and waiting for Jesus will welcome him. will say, lo, here is our God, we have waited for him. In Revelation 14, 12, 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished their work and were prepared for the trying hour before them. They had received the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord and the living testimony had been revived. The last great warning had sounded everywhere and it had stirred up and enraged the inhabitants of the earth who would not receive the message. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a right, writer's inkhorn by his side we had reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hand and with a loud voice said, It is done. And on the angelic host laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case had been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. The marriage of the Lamb was consummated. And the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus and the heirs of salvation. And Jesus was to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. As Jesus moved out of the holy place, the most holy place, I heard a tinkling of bells upon his garment, and as he left, a cloud of darkness covered the inhabitants of the earth. There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. While Jesus had been standing between God and guilty man, a restraint was put upon the people. But when he stepped out from between man and the Father, the restraint was removed and Satan had entire control of the finally impenitent. It was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. But as his work there was finished and his intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God and it breaks with fury upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner who has slighted salvation and hated reproof. In that fearful time, after the close of Jesus' mediation, the saints were living in the sight of an holy God without an intercessor. Every case was decided, every jewel numbered. Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and the sins which had been confessed while he was in the most holy place were placed upon Satan, the originator of sin, who must suffer their punishment. Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown. Surrounded by the angelic host, he left heaven. The plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth. Some were denouncing God and cursing him. Others rushed to the people of God and begged to be taught how they might escape his judgments. But the saints had nothing for them. The last tear for sinners had been shed, the last agonizing prayer offered, the last burden borne, the last warning given. The sweet voice of mercy was no more to invite them. When the saints in all heaven were interested for their salvation, they had no interest for themselves. Life and death had been set before them. Many desired life but made no effort to obtain it. They did not choose life, and now there was no atoning blood to cleanse the guilty, no compassionate Savior to plead for them and cry, Spare, spare the sinner a little longer. All heaven 
and united with Jesus as they heard the fearful words, It is done. It is finished. The plan of salvation had been accomplished and few had chosen to accept it. And as mercy's sweet voice died away, fear and horror seized the wicked. With terrible distinctness they heard the words, Too late! Too late! Those who had not prized God's words were hurrying to and fro, wandering from sea to sea, and from the north to the east to seek the word of the Lord. Said the angel, They shall not find it. There is a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the words of the Lord. What will they not give for one word of approval from God? But no, they must hunger and thirst. Day after day have they slighted salvation, prizing earthly riches and earthly pleasure higher than any heavenly treasure or inducement. They have rejected Jesus and despised the saints. The filthy must remain filthy forever. Many of the wicked were greatly enraged as they suffered the effects of the plagues. It was a scene of fearful agony. Parents were bitterly reproaching their children, and children their parents, brothers their sisters, and sisters their brothers. Loud, wailing cries were heard in every direction. It was you who kept me from receiving the truth which would have saved me from this awful hour. The people turned upon their ministers in bitter hate and reproached them, saying, You have not warned us. You told us that all the world would be converted and cried, Peace, peace, to quiet every fear that was aroused. You have not told us of this hour, and those who warned us of it you declared to be fanatics and evil men who would ruin us. But I saw the ministers did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than their of their people. I saw the saints leaving the city and villages and associating together in companies and living in the most solitary places. Angels provided them with food and water while the wicked were suffering from hunger and thirst. Then I saw the leading men of the earth consulting together, and Satan and his angels busy around them. I saw writing, copies of which were scattered in different parts of the land, giving orders that unless the saints should yield their peculiar faith, give up the Sabbath, and observe the first day of the week, the people were at liberty after a certain time to put them to death. But in this hour of trial the saints were calm and composed, trusting in God and leaning upon his promise that a way of escape would be made for them. In some places, before the time of the decree to be executed, the wicked rushed upon the saints to slay them, but angels in the form of men in war fought for them. Satan wished to have the privilege of destroying the saints of the Most High, but Jesus bade his angels watch over them. God would be honored by making a covenant with those who had kept his law in the sight of the heathen round about them. And Jesus would be honored by translating without their seeing death the faithful waiting ones who had so long expected him. Soon I saw saints suffering great mental anguish. They seemed to be surrounded by the wicked inhabitants of the earth. Every appearance was against them. And some began to fear that God had at last left them to perish by the hand of the wicked. Oh friend, but if their eyes could have been opened, they would have seen themselves surrounded by angels of God. Next came the multitude of the angry wicked, and next a mass of evil angels, hurrying on the wicked to slay the saints. But before they could approach God's people, the wicked first must pass this company of mighty holy angels. This was impossible. The angels of God were causing them to recede and also causing the evil angels who were pressing around them to fall back. It was an hour of fearful, terrible agony to the saints. Day and night they cried unto God for deliverance. And to outward appearance, there was no possibility of their escape. The wicked had already began to triumph, crying out, 
Why doesn't your God deliver you out of our hands? Oh, why don't you give up? Save yourselves. But the saints heeded them not. The swords that were raised to kill God's people broke and fell as powerless as a straw. Angels of God shielded the saints. As they cried day and night for deliverance, their cry came up before the Lord. It was at midnight that God chose to deliver his people. As the wicked were mocking around them, suddenly the sun appeared, shining in his strength, and the moon stood still. The wicked looked upon the scene with amazement, while the saints beheld the solemn joy, the tokens of their deliverance. Signs and wonders followed in quick succession. Everything seemed turned out of its natural course. The streams ceased to flow. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. But there was one clear place of settled glory, whence came the voice of God like many waters, shaking the heavens and the earth. There was a mighty earthquake. The graves were opened, and those who had died in faith under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath, came forth from their dusty beds, glorified to hear the covenant of peace that God was to make with those who had kept his law. The sky opened and shut and was in commotion. The mountains shook like a reed in the wind and cast out ragged rocks all around. The sea boiled like a pot and cast out stones upon the land. And as God spake the day and the hour of Jesus' coming and delivered the everlasting covenant to his people, he spoke one sentence and then paused while the words were rolling through the earth. The Israel of God stood with their eyes fixed upward, listening to the words as they came from the mouth of Jehovah and rolled through the earth like peals of loudest thunder. It was an awfully solemn. At the end of every sentence, the saint shouted, Glory! Hallelujah! Their countenances were lighted up with the glory of God, and they shone with glory as the face of Moses as he came down from Sinai. The wicked could not look upon them for the glory. And when their never-ending blessing was pronounced on those who had honored God in keeping his Sabbath holy, there was a mighty shout of victory over the beast and over his image. Then commenced the jubilee when the land should rest. I saw the pious slavery rise in victory and triumph and shake off the chains that bound him while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not what to do. For the wicked could not understand the voice and the words of the voice of God. Soon appeared the great white cloud upon which sat the Son of Man. When it first appeared in the distance, this cloud looked very small. The angel said that it was a sign of the Son of Man. As it drew nearer to the earth, we could behold the excellent glory and majesty of Jesus as he rode forth to conquer, a retinue of holy angels with bright glittering crowns upon their heads escorted him on his way. No language could describe the glory of the sea. The living cloud of majesty and surpassed glory came still nearer, and we could clearly behold the lovely person of Jesus. He did not wear a crown of thorns, but a crown of glory rested upon his holy brow. Upon his vesture and thigh was a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His countenance was as bright as the noonday sun, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet had the appearance of fine brass. His voice sounded like many musical instruments. The earth trembled before him. The heavens departed as a scroll, as it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Those who a short time before could would have destroyed God's faithful children from the earth, now witness the glory of God which rested upon them. 
Amid all their terror, they heard the voices of the saints in joyful strains, saying, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. The earth mightily shook as the voice of the Son of God called forth the sleeping saints. They responded to the call and came forth clothed with glorious immortality, crying, Victory! Victory over death in the grave! O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Then the living saints and the risen ones raised their voices in a long transporting shout of victory. Those bodies that had gone down to the grave, bearing the marks of disease and death, came up in immortal health and vigor. The living saints are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and caught up with the risen ones and together they meet their Lord in the air. Oh, what a glorious meeting. Friends whom death had separated were united, never more to part. On each side of the cloudy chariot were wings and beneath it were living wheels. And as the chariot rolled upward, the wheels cried, Holy! And the wings, as they moved, cried, Holy! And the retinue of holy angels around the cloud cried, Holy! 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 Lord God Almighty! And the saints in the cloud cried, Glory! Alleluia! And the chariot rolled up to the holy city. Before entering the city, the saints were arranged in a perfect square with Jesus in the midst. He stood head and shoulders above the saints and above the angels. His majestic form and lovely countenances could be seen by all in the square. Then I saw a very great number of angels bring from the city glorious crowns, a crown for every saint with his name written thereon. As Jesus called for the crowns, angels presented them to him, and with his own right hand, the lovely Jesus placed the crowns on the heads of the saints. In the same manner, the angels brought the harps, and Jesus presented them also to the saints. The commanding angels first struck the note, and then every voice was raised in grateful, happy praise, and every hand skillfully swept over the strings of the harp, sending forth melodious music in rich and perfect strains. Then I saw Jesus lead the redeemed company to the gate of the city. He, lead, he laid hold of the gate and swung it back on its glittering hinges and bade the nation that had kept the truth enter in. Within the city there was everything to feast the eye, rich glory they beheld everywhere. Then Jesus looked upon his redeemed saints. Their countenances were radiant with glory. And as he fixed his loving eyes upon them, he said with his rich musical voice, I behold the travail of my soul and I'm satisfied. This rich glory is yours to keep and to receive forevermore. Saints, let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this words of promise. You have pulled back the curtains of history, of, sorry, of prophecy, and showed us what is in store for us. Only we must be faithful to you. Oh Lord, thank you for saving us from this sin-cursed earth. Take us away soon, O God, that we may enjoy the raptures of heaven. I thank you so much for the vision of Ellen White that gives us hope, that gives us joy, and help us, O oh God, to be faithful to you until the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friend, that's all for today. I thank you very much for being with me. And I always remember that God loves you. Yes, he really, really does love you. I'm a true, old-fashioned, dyed-in-the-wool, Christ-loving, Bible-believing, veggie-eating, spirit of prophecy-embracing, Sabbath-keeping, the Lord's return-awaiting, prophecy-studying, Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> I was a young man of 21, having a good time back in my native land of Guyana, South America. <laughs> 